Okay, I believe we are now live, but it takes a few more seconds for all the settings to, to filter through. That closes and then yes. So now we'll wait for a moment. We'll get all of the attendees who are in the other session over to this session. Wait on that number to go up. Around the mid 40s. So that looks like everybody is moving sessions now. So I think we can go ahead and get started. All right. Onward and upward, the uh, the fourth the fourth talk of the day. Thank you all for thank you all for being there. Uh, um, it's my my distinct pleasure to introduce a, a, a really exciting talk from uh, the team involved with the uh, the Capture ERC project. Uh, so this is Isto uh, Huvila, Lisa Bergeson, Otis Gold, and, and Zana Freiberg of uh, of uh, Uppsala University. All of Uppsala University. Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, and uh, they'll be talking to us today on understanding masking in scholarly data publishing and reuse, exploratory study of practices relating to obscurities in archaeological data. So please uh, take it away. Thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, so I'll start by saying that we hope to do a presentation of around 30 minutes and follow that up with some QA. And before really launching into the presentation of this exploratory study, we would just like to present some context. So the study we're going to talk to today is part of the work we're doing in the research project Capture, capturing paradata for documenting data creation and use for the region of the future. Uh, and this is a project funded by the European Research Council. Let's switch slides. And as you can probably tell from the title of our project, uh, Paradata is quite a central concept for us. And as we understand it, it is data about processes and tools involved in creating research data. So it's kin to other auxiliary data types like process, provenance, and context data. And our overarching research objective is to understand more about how to capture and document enough of these processes to make data truly reusable. And we're coming at this from an information science perspective. And we're looking mainly at cultural heritage data and particularly at archeological data. And this data could be physical artifacts, it could be drawings, samples, measurements, and 3D models. Uh, a wider range of different data sets collected in several different ways by different methods. And this diversity really intensifies the need for explicit information about uh, provenance and processes involved in the data collection in order to facilitate reuse. Can switch slides again. Uh, but it's no easy matter, especially when we come to data publishing. Uh, there are no set ways of informing about provenance and process of writing about paradata. A researcher is always faced with what to add, uh, how much to add, and sometimes adding isn't always better. More information isn't always better. So maybe not add at all or reduce. Uh, these are all complexities and the data are full of complexities uh, that every data publisher is continuously faced with project by project. And the resulting adding or avoiding to add paradata uh, is a community act, uh, a wish to make the work understood in a correct way. And this could entail uh, wanting to present the data in a way that feels perfect, that will ensure that it's not misunderstood or misused, or that you will face critique for the way you presented your data. And understanding of this act is key both to understanding the origin stories of paradata and a work towards better support in data, paradata creation and dissemination for the benefit of data reusability. And it is in this context, the exploratory study we'll talk to you about today fits into our project. And 
with that, I hope you have sufficient background context and I will leave the next slide to my Thank you, Sanna. Um, so the purpose of this analysis of this talk that we're um, offering today is to provide some insight into how researchers deal with data related uncertainties in data publishing practices. And this purpose is met by an analysis of what provenance and process information researchers think about should be presented with research data, what they identify as difficult in producing in data provenance and process descriptions, and the strategies they use to work around these difficulties. And I think that the kind of connection between the conference theme and our talk here emerges quite clearly. Uh, one of the products of science that have been increasingly uh, digital is research data. And there are presently many drivers that push STEM and SSH scholars to publish um, the research data that they collect in repositories that are not only for kind of local project group use, but actually enable kind of widespread large scale access and reuse of the data that they have collected. And research data publishing is an aspect of the digitization of science and its products that is becoming more and more kind of ubiquitous and more and more impactful, we would argue. But that, it, that also is kind of to some extent um, understudied and underexplored. And because every data set has, has kind of some degree of epistemological uncertainty, getting a better understanding of, of how researchers think and act when dealing with um, data uncertainty in the data that they are publishing in digital repositories is kind of a key step towards realizing the offerings of research data publishing to a larger degree. And in this talk, um, I mean, there are many potential aspects we could kind of delve into uh, in, in this topic that we outlined so far. But in this talk, our particular focus is set on exploring how the twin concepts of masking and unmasking can be used to understand the researcher strategies for reducing or increasing the amount of su supplementary information that they add to research data. And what is masking and unmasking in the context of scholarly data publishing? Then that's a good question. Well. Uh, I guess generally put, masking can be referred to can refer to such things as lessening the degree of messiness, uncertainty, and guesswork in the data, to decreasing the granularity of detail in the data, and to black box descriptions of methods and use of methods. Uh, and unmasking would be the the opposite thing. That is to say, uh, adding a lot of um, process and uh, provenance data to a data set to, um, that can kind of explain all the details of how data was put into being, basically. And masking and unmasking of data can be done in many ways for many reasons uh, with a varying degree of deliberateness. But it, they signify kind of at its core some kind of territorial action that for some reason hides or obscures or that does not approximate the complexity of published data, or when it comes to um, unmasking, does the opposite. That is to say, highlight the complexity of the published data. So we have, of course, not invented these concepts. They are um, they came from psychology originally, I think. But let's delve into two kind of brief examples of how masking and ma on, on the unmasking have been e explored in the literature. So uh, here we got a quote from Turkos book, Evocative Objects, Things We Think With. And um, Turkel uses this uh, metaphor of the front room and back room knowledge to explain the nature of scholarly knowledge production. And uh, what is claimed here in this quote is that the back room is, some, is um, pretty messy, a chaotic space while the front room knowledge and front room knowledge here would be um, the things that we put in papers and books and chapters and publish are um, tidy. Uh, but the argument here is that um, front room knowledge is constructed and that we make a clean story to max mask our anxieties about the chaotic state of the little that we know. Another example here that is kind of lies, lies closest to the archeological data that we are uh, exploring is taken from this paper by Ulla. And um, 
they talk about um, data sets that are old and that many researchers have been using and adding to under kind of a long period of time. So masking here would be, for example, uh, to quote this, um, subsequent reprojection of coordinates that were initially recorded as rounded values would mask the fact that they were rounded originally. Um, yeah, so um, I give the mic to Lisa. We'll talk a bit about our research design. Yes, thank you so much. We are uh, currently conducting this interview study, and uh, our goal is to include 30 archaeologists covering as many subspecialties as possible, um, everything from GIS to music archaeology. The uh, types of expertise uh, present in this uh, subset uh, that we are analyzing for this pilot is uh, classical uh, Mediterranean archaeology, archaeological remote sensing, uh, landscape archaeology, and archaeological data integration. And these are the self-reported expertise of the interviewees. So you see that we, we are already uh, have quite a range. Um, and these are all researchers that in some capacity work to produce, integrate, make available, or use research data uh, as, as a part of their research work. Uh, and they can also have other um, um, appointments, such as uh, project manager of uh, database uh, projects or, or teaching database construction or uh, such um, other roles. Um, we have um, analyzed these interviews uh, in in vivo and using a ground up um, strategy or method to to identify uh, what these interviewees um, uh, experience as challenges in working with data and how they deal with these challenges. And so we're we're still in the process of of grouping and naming our categories. So, so we're looking forward to have your questions and your input uh, on this analysis that we're, we're presenting here. Uh, next slide, please. Yes, so what do we mean by data complexities uh, in this case? Um, well, um, we already see a, a quite a variety of different data complexities that researchers deal with. Uh, some of these relate to data content. Uh, for example, if you wish to integrate data generated over multiple decades, uh, there might be that the data from the uh, mid 19, like the 1950s, um, you have the data, but you don't have uh, any explicit um, methods description, so you don't really know uh, what the uh, observations represent, um, but you still want to use it to integrate it uh, to get a, a full or a large um, uh, data set to, to analyze. Uh, it can also be like the state of data that's uh, complex or uncertain in, in some way. Um, it can be that you know that there are, in fact, uh, a certain number of, of um, investigations undertaken in a certain region, but you can only find, when you search, you can only find uh, that uh, a selection of these has been reported. Uh, so you understand there's a backlog somewhere, but you don't know where it is and how to, to locate it. It can also be such things as uh, we heard in the earlier talk today, uh, questions about terminal, terminological uncertainties, that there are terms that are perhaps broad and descriptive, ter broad descriptive terms, and you don't really know why they use such broad terms. Is it because uh, they, there was a lack of time when they conducted the investigation? Was there not enough evidence to pinpoint a uh, more narrow uh, find type or time period, et cetera. Uh, so, so in the original title of this talk, we, we use the term data obscurities. And then along the sort of process, we have also used the term uh, data uncertainties. But we sort of have arrived at using complexities 
is a better way of describing all these different kinds of challenges that um, that uh, puts the researcher in a situation where you have to pick a strategy how to deal with it. And just to give one example of such strategy that is sort of makes me smile at least um, is one of our interviewees. Um, this person had a strategy that you know she said uh, anyone actually working with research data knows that it's imperfect and incomplete. And this is sort of a strategy to to <laughs> like this is how I think about research data, and I assume everybody else thinks about research data in this way as well. So it's sort of a generalizing um, uh, acceptance of, of uh, complexity. Uh, but as we will see now that we proceed to the next slide, <laughs> we have identified several different strategies for dealing with, with data complexities in our um, interview material. And naturally, as we are information science researchers, we we look at information uh, and we look at um, do these uh, strategies that researchers um, employ result in added information or do they res not result in any added information uh, like in the background we, we always have we're thinking about data descriptions and metadata that's that's what you know we are sort of oriented towards. Um, so when we look at the strategies uh, that result in added information, we see, for one part, traditional um, strategies like increasing metadata, um, adding textual scope notes of uh, metadata categories, or, or adding literature references in metadata, for example, like expanding the traditional metadata um, scheme. Um, also turning to, to set formats such as data journals to, to explain more about the methodology. Uh, then we also see some more um, freeform uh, ways of, of um, uh, dealing with, with data complexities like signposting processuality or incompleteness. For example, uh, on a project main page of a database. So the idea then is that the database user <laughs> will first go to the project main page before they access the database and they will read on the main page, you know, what's the status of this database and they will hopefully remember that when they start looking into the database and, and uh, extracting information for their or extracting data for their further uh, use. It can also be um, such things as, as trying to explicate and verbalize tacit provenance and process knowledge in different forms and formats and uh, also versioning uh, creating libraries of, of versions of, of uh, a data set for example uh, in github or other repositories and on next slide uh, we have an example of one of these freeform um, strategies for for explicating uh, a process. Uh, so this is a, a, an archaeologist um, working on with multivariate spectral data to identify uh, components in, in rock material. Uh, so he's explaining to me that, uh, well, there's a file on the pre-processing pre -processing, um, and I portion each, each step of what I do and I have a more general description of what I do. And then I also save the scripts that I'm running. And I'm, I'm combining these together into one narrative. So I'm, what he basically is doing is he, that he's <laughs> telling about what he is doing. And he's telling about what he is telling his <laughs> machine or his equipment to do. And then it's combining this into one narrative that he, he hopes will inform uh, an eventual data user. So next slide, please. Then we have, on the other hand, different strategies for dealing with data complexities that does actually not add any information. 
And one such strategy was, is, as I mentioned earlier, earlier uh, just accepting, you know, accepting complexity. Um, another is relying uh, on, on someone else's knowledge, on a data scientist's knowledge, or on reuser expertise. So thinking and arguing like, I don't need to explain all this because I know that my, whoever uses this data will, will understand. There are also different practical strategies uh, like changing or limiting focus to a less, less complex data source, postponing data description tasks, uh, or reducing or avoiding specificity in, in data descriptions. Um, and also we see that there is sometimes a hesitance to present data and also tendency sometimes to, to set unattainable goals for data quality thresholds uh, for publishing. So I will publish this, but not until I have quality checked it for, it will be 100% quality checked. Um, that's what I'm going for. So next slide. Um, so this is one, one illustration of what uh, a strategy uh, not adding information can look like. Um, so it's uh, a database where they have uh, worked meticulously to, to create one of these 100% uh, perfect databases. Um, but then they have overlooked uh, referencing to where uh, they got the, the um, uh, numbers from. Did they get it from, from lab reports or did they get it uh, from second, uh, second hand sources, second level sources like reports? Um, so, so they have overlooked uh, a certain type of specificity. Uh, next slide. <laughs> So, uh, but we, um, you know, the uh, strategies um, that um, does not uh, provide any information could be seen, as we mentioned earlier, it could be just interpreted as, as sloppy research practice, and not being explicit enough about what you're doing. But when we interpret all these, um, all these strategies as communicative acts uh, and put them into this masking unmasking grid um, we see that uh, well there are actually strategies that doesn't add any information to the research data that can be understood as uh, communicative acts in the sense that they are reducing complexity uh, to uh, to communicate the data uh, in a more effective way um, we also note that uh, what, what counts as masking or unmasking in a certain situation would probably, we would probably need to, to interpret it in, a, in, in its context, because such an act as explaining a particular process uh, or method in a data journal, for example, if it's done the first time as an uh, innovative act and a revolutionary sort of first time description, it's, it's, um, it can be counted or interpreted as, as unmasking. While if it's done with, you know, <laughs> copy paste method, this is always how this method is described. Um, we're doing this uh, over and over again as a disciplinary standard. It's, it's um, likely to be more of a masking strategy. Next slide. What we also see when we uh, interpret these um, strategy, strategies um, in, the, in the masking unmasking uh, typology grid, uh, we see that certain strategies uh, of data avoidance fall outside of this grid and are actually uh, strategies that, that um, steer away from communicating about data at all. Uh, so examples of this is um, like when you're 
changing or limiting your focus to a less complex data source instead of diving into and verbalizing what's complex about this data source that you were looking at in the first hand. Um, this is a really interesting case, we think, uh, the, the instances of data avoidance, and we'll pick up uh, on that later on. Um, Ulle. Thank you, Lisa. Excellent stuff. Um, yeah, so just a brief uh, reflection then on our approach, trying to kind of say something about how people deal with um, uncertainty, data uncertainties in the context of data publishing and reuse using this masking and masking dichotomy. Uh, we found that this dichotomy is pretty useful for interpreting kind of a number of strategies for dealing with data complexities. Um, and the, these result both in, of course, added information uh, and, and then those not kind of adding any information. Uh, one limitation of this approach, as Lisa said, is that this dichotomy doesn't actually cover these strategies of data avoidance. And it's likely important to going forward, um, trying to you know, understand how we further can understand these strategies. Um, so uh, basically the analysis shows that data avoidance is something that is likely kind of worthwhile to pursue in further studies. Uh, and questions, important questions to ask then would likely be something along the lines of uh, what happens when data is avoided in publishing or reuse scenarios? What are the consequences of avoiding data in this context? And what are the reasons kind of underpinning uh, its occurrence uh, and motivating people to avoid data in this sense? Um, yeah, exactly. I think I move ahead a bit now with reference to the time. Um, so there are, of course, many interesting things to kind of pick out and put the spotlight on when it comes to this presentation here, or at least can we think so. Uh, I'm going to try to delve into, into a few, few of them that kind of seems most, most um, interesting for this particular um, arrangement here. So one thing we could talk a bit about is the kind of the social productivity of masking and unmasking in the context of science. Uh, Turkel, the, the person that we referred to previously in this presentation, uh, writes that all published or finished knowledge products are basically to some degree cleaned and that its certainties are constructed or at least that its uncertainties are to some degree kind of hidden. And I think that this kind of leads us to think about what existing masking and, and um, to what extent that masking and unmasking strategies are kind of inter integral parts of commonplace ways of doing science, creating data, analyzing it and publishing it. Uh, for example, can the lessening of complexity of a data set that would be masking, can, can it be considered to be some kind of uh, you know, a requirement, a requirement for any type of epist epistemological work where results are attained and, and reported. And something that would be interesting to think a bit about also is to what degree that masking is actually a detriment um, and a key component of affecting publication, of effective publication and reuse strategies of research data. And it would be interesting to think a bit about what the threshold is that determines when kind of productive uses of masking uh, instead becomes illicit ones. And that is to say that you can strive to um, um, hide the, the um, limitations or weaknesses of a data set. And something that we have arrived here also is that when kind of thinking a bit about masking and unmasking going forward, it would be a potentially kind of useful interpretive axis to use is to think about it as uh, an area that is um, affected by, you know, kind of people's illicit purposes, that is to say kind of hiding uncertainties or weaknesses in a data set, productive purposes and uses of masking. And this would be kind of rendering complexities workable um, and communicable when reporting on the on, um, a data set. And that this, these two kind of um, points would then intersect with technical or kind of infrastructural requirements of data publishing. And this would be, for instance, uh, certain data repositories that use preset metadata schemas that can actually be adapted to the specificities of, of uh, the data set that is being published. And another thing about that is important to, to consider here is, of course, um, 
disciplinary and domain perspectives because science is done in very different ways in different disciplines and certainty and there are surely kind of different ways of dealing with uncertainty by masking or unmasking and you know different um, across the in the different disciplines kind of across the SSH and STEM spectrums. Uh, moving ahead to the conclusions here, um, we would like to say that it might be kind of somewhat straightforward at least to identify how researchers deal with data related uncertainties, but it's much more difficult to figure out the role of such activities in kind of the larger uh, realm of digital science. And masking is done with many in underpinning uh, motivations and um, unmasking as well. And it's done by using many different types of kind of approaches and mechanisms. So one question we could ask is kind of to what extent is it feasible to use a single theoretical dichotomy such as masking and unmasking to explain um, data related uncertainties. And what we found was that uh, when thinking about that is that these concepts, this, this dichotomy of masking and unmasking, it's useful to understand uh, data descriptions, uh, how they kind of fulfill different types of communicative intentions. And that uh, this dichotomy is kind of potentially useful to explain how data makers and data publishers respond to and interact with regulations, guidelines, and for instance, schemes for um, data descriptions. And also that it's important to kind of take into account when designing process and metadata schemes and that data sharing systems, uh, how to design these for dealing with data complexities and uncertainties and these strategies of masking and unmasking and unmasking that we know are pretty prevalent and uh, different ways of doing science. And I think I'm going to uh, leave the closing to Sana. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so the next next steps for us are within the projects many, of course, but uh, for this particular explorative study, uh, we're working towards completing the interview study. And as both Ulla and Lisa touched upon, uh, delve a bit deeper into strategies for dealing with data complexities beyond masking and unmasking looking at ways and developing analytical tools to analyze such things as data avoidance, for example. And uh, I would also just like to say that additionally, we are uh, conducting a survey on making and using archaeological data. So if anyone in the audience happens to be an archaeologist or no one, uh, we would be very thankful if you would have a look at the survey, maybe complete it, or just tell someone about it. We've included a link, but it can also be found on our web page. And with that, we can take the next slide, where I will extend our combined thank you uh, to everyone in the audience for listening to our talk. And as you have probably noticed, this is exploratory work, and we I uh, would welcome any input or ideas that you have and are also happy to answer any questions about both this study and our project. So thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, questions, questions pouring in. Um, so let me start with one from, uh, from Stefan Hesperian who asks, uh, there's an ongoing discussion uh, on using things like uh, like uh, Python notebooks for reproducible research, and I wonder to what extent that kind of conversation gets picked up uh, in 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 you guys' work and in, in the leaning in the more digital realm. Well, um, uh, again, I I will stress that this is um, we will have a different answer when we have the full data set. Uh, but um, some, like archaeology is the, a discipline where, where uh, there's quite a lot of uh, researchers who themselves develop um, uh, programming uh, skills, uh, and they are more uh, keen on, on using those types of, of technologies for their documentation. But there's also a really strong uh, documentation um, tradition uh, coming from within the archaeology discipline that will not easily, you know, uh, give uh, uh, 
give uh, room for for new technologies. Uh, you know, we'll, they will not just hand over the the responsibility, to, so to say, to new technologies, but it has to go um, together with with the uh, established traditions in the the discipline. And this also has to do with with the, the fact that archaeology is in many countries also quite strictly regulated and bounded by uh, the need to, to report uh, findings and results to, to um, government uh, authorities in different forms. Uh, so, so, yeah, would anyone want to add any other answer? <laughs> Perhaps just a brief interjection um, in the kind of realm of archaeology, with kind of which focuses on um, creating three D renderings and models of sites and different types of archaeological environments. Uh, there's been this pretty intense kind of discussion about how to um, capture the making of these three D renderings, so that people can actually, to some degree, kind of reproduce um, the interpretations and the kind of techniques that were applied to you know, creating the final product. So that might be some kind of um, an example that mirrors um, the one mentioned in the question to some extent. Great. Um, the next next upvoted question is is mine. So I'll 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 take take the opportunity to self indulge a little. Um, have you been able to get an idea of which kinds of publics your various interviewees have in mind when they think about reuse? So I know this is, a, I mean, this is obviously a, a, for archaeology, especially, it's a much more multifaceted question than it probably seems at first to those of us who are less familiar with, with archaeology, because this might be a real driver of, of strategy choice. So what kinds of, what kinds of reuse scenarios are even, are do the various people have in mind here, do you think? So, um, well, well, as we mentioned, archaeology is a very, very varied discipline. Um, so there are both examples where, where um, the reuse imagined is um, other researchers wanting to do uh, studies on the same, same region, for example, in the Mediterranean area somewhere, uh, so regional interest. But there may also be, uh, since archaeologists uh, integrate their interests with so many other uh, disciplines, there are, for example, um, uh, like uh, archaeologists focusing on uh, on um, volcanic ash uh, data. Um, so they are, uh, you know, directing their work towards the the geophysical. Um, uh, space um, and uh, and discipline and uh, again uh, different um, like topical uh, publics so to speak so there's uh, a real uh, like range uh, yeah or or certain 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 materials like ceramics <laughs> like the ceramics community is a huge uh, huge thing Yeah, Great, thanks. That, oh yeah, please. Sorry, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, very briefly in uh, in the interviews that that um, I've met, at least the only time that kind of the publics that were considered when publishing data were something else than other archaeologists within basically the same kind of area of archaeology was in the you know public find scenario, and these are repositories where you know if you kind of find a sword in a lake, you send it to the public finds uh, office, and then they kind of document it, and then they. Um, are not only geared towards kind of other archaeologists, but rather, um, you know, people inhabiting that part of the country in kind of a more general way. That's really interesting. That's cool. Um, okay, next up, a uh, question, actually, two, two kind of related questions coming in. A uh, question from uh, Beckett Sterner, who asks, so do your interviewees talk about the value of masking and unmasking in connection with data or modeling standards? So he says here he's thinking about uh, Milleran's work on making private troubles into public issues as part of the ecological metadata language. So how do, how do, how do data or modeling standards interact here? Mm 
Mm, yeah. Would you like to start, Ole? <laughs> yeah, I can start. I think that this is a very good question and it's very complex. And I think the people that we talk to also consider this to be very uh, complex as well. So I would say that my impression is that standards are generally understood to be something that, that is very, very useful in a general sense, but perhaps less useful when it comes to the particular data set that people are actually kind of talking about. And that there is definitely this kind of discrepancy between what people are willing and to do in terms of curing, curating their data set um, to kind of fit the standard and to what is kind of actually done. And this kind of connects to this example where sometimes the kind of the ideal of the kind of perfect data um, publishing approach uh, actually comes in the way of actually publishing the data so that someone can kind of look at it. Lisa, do you have anything to kind of tag on to that? Well, um... Like I, it's a little difficult with it with the interaction here and then clarifying the question. But but um, really, something that I could add is um, that uh, sometimes um, sometimes uh, archaeologists, uh, you know, sometimes they take help from from other people uh, doing sort of the data data modeling uh, work. Uh, so sometimes it's lack box in terms of you know the division of uh, responsibility between different persons um so like that the data scientist knows what what we did with the data and i know what we know based on the data um so that's also a, a sort of how standards play into uh how things are done with data in this um type of work. So that's actually a nice segue into the last question that I have here from uh, from Sarah Davies, who has so, so says, super interesting presentation. I wonder if there are parallels with data practices in other disciplines, like, uh, for instance, in bioinformatics or, or biocuration. So uh, have you looked into comparisons with with other fields? And how do you see that? How do you see that working in your project? Would you Perhaps like we... to that one listo as the yes, project lead <laughs> yeah. yeah sure uh, I, I can obviously do that yeah uh, our focus in, the, in this project is uh, is on archaeology and uh, that's kind of a sort of kind of an empirical lens uh, to look at at data reuse and data documentation practices uh, and uh, what we're going to do in the future is to do a few excursions to other fields as well. At the same time, we chose, or I chose uh, archaeology uh, for the reason that it's it's a certain kind of an interesting field in a sense that it's uh, so interdisciplinary. So you, we can kind of get part of uh, those other fields as well. We're working with um, people um, uh, who are interacting with uh, uh, science, science data and uh, very kind of textual humanities data and so on. But um, uh, kind of comparing to uh, what uh, what we know about other fields. Uh, so yes, there are definitely many similarities, uh, although there are also many differences and the, maybe the kind of the difference is what is uh, a key to many of them is uh, precisely the kind of the interdisciplinarity of uh, the archaeological research enterprise in a sense that uh, that kind of uh, with a certain kind of data you are a part of a specific community but then as a part of kind of when you are using the data in an archaeological context so then you have to take into account other archaeological communities so it's sort of a kind of a balancing act, act uh, between uh, different communities and uh, that's quite apparently something that pertains to other fields as well but there are similarities and uh, kind of people deal with data in sim uh, similar ways but then at, at the same time there are there are differences you know, depending on, on context and situation. Fantastic. Great. Uh, that's all our questions and we're full on time. So thank